Golik and Smeddy here. Welcome to another edition of Golik and Smeddy. I am Mike Golik Sr. Uh, Jessica Smetana normally with me, uh, a.k.a. Smeddy, but she is on vacation enjoying some time away from me and from Stu. Uh, so I'm sure she's very happy. And I had to search high and low for a fill-in for this. And I couldn't find anybody. So I just called my son, Mike, uh, to see if he would fill in. Gojo, as you all know him here on DraftKings with his show, his podcast, Gojo. What's up there, sonny boy? Uh, nothing, man. I was going to say Jess's vacation looks excellent. And Doesn't I it? Think we both wish that we were. You know what? It's weird. We've been fortunate as a family to go on a bunch of really nice vacations. And we have our friends, the Perianos, who we've gone to some pretty cool spots with. Yeah, like, yeah. We have not been deprived in that area. No. But I figured out in the Instagram age, none of us are that good at taking pictures. Like Mrs. Periano has the you know high-end camera that she'll use sometimes for these things. But in general, we don't present our trips to Instagram no. and social media well enough. And so I'm always like, damn are we is everyone else balling that much harder than us yeah she takes incredible pictures of her doing incredible things she's she's overseas she's out of the country and you're right when we went on the um we went on the safari with the perianos mrs p took pictures with a real camera though that's what i don't know with jess is it a is it a f camera phone or is it a real well, camera i i that, don't know that's kind of the best part about 2022 is phone camera technologies become so updated that you can't really tell the difference in a lot of those. But like, again, to your point about Mrs. Periano, she took all those pictures and then put them into a physical book for us. A we book, got like a yeah. physical scrapbook as right. opposed to everyone else who just uploads them on the line. So it was just funny to me to have that realization just now that, oh, wait a minute, we've done a bunch of cool stuff. We just don't know how to present it to anyone because we're yeah. stupid. Yeah, we, we documented the old-fashioned way, or at least Mrs. P did. And the book is phenomenal, by the way. It's a great book. made of the safari, but much different than what Jess is doing on vacation. So you, didn't you take a trip like this? You went you went to a few places overseas a few years ago, right? Just with a with a few people, just kind of, kind of, kind of bopping around? Yeah, so I've done this a couple of times, being, you know, in your mid-20s and now early 30s and single without a kid means – you can just kind of pick up and go when people say yes. So yeah, I did, uh, I mean, probably seven years ago now, I did a trip from uh, London to Paris to Amsterdam. I did four years ago, a trip to Colombia. So we did, uh, we went to Cartagena, we went to Medellin, we did all those things. And yeah, just I kind of picked up. I do the thing where I find someone who is much more capable than me of, putting together an itinerary for the trip. Some people that like to plan out all those activities and get things going, AKA what mom does on our family vacations. Right, right, right. And then I just latch onto that person. I offer whatever I need to financially to help out with the cause. And then I just show up with a positive attitude and I double as security because I'm a large enough guy in these foreign areas to kind of be a deterrent sometimes should anything arise. So this is how outdated again, I am and, and your mother is I remember when you were doing these trips and you said you were going to one of the stops was Columbia. Your mother and I immediately thought of drug cartel and what the hell are you doing? But it turns out it's a wonderful place to visit, is it not? Yeah, and, and that was the kind of message they gave us is especially yeah. <laughs> when you're in Medellin because everyone thinks of drug cartels and all the violence oh, that who, went on there. Yeah, who hasn't watched Narcos? I mean, seriously, man. <laughs> exactly, but you go on all these tours and everyone there, the locals are basically imploring you to go back and tell people, hey, it's not like that anymore because tourism is a big part of how they make money over there. They want to let everyone know it is safe. It's a totally different environment. And so, yeah, we had a great trip over there. Big recommend for anyone who wants to check it out. All right. Well, so I'm glad you did that trip. Jess is on that trip right now. So she is enjoying herself. So I'm stuck here doing this uh, pod with you, which you, you're releasing one every single day for DraftKings Gojo, which is, are, are you enjoying that? The back Because you were every day for six and a half years at ESPN, some of that you and I together uh, for four hours. There were times you were doing six hours of radio, four to six in the morning and then six to 10 with me and Trey. And then you had a hiatus when you were left ESPN before you started with DraftKings. And now you're back to every day. So 
How was that enjoying the time off, but then now going back to daily sports talk? Time off was awesome. Yeah. I learned how to cook better. I've been taking Spanish on Duolingo on my phone. I still haven't learned a ton of it, but it's the thought that counts. And I don't know, just having time to not do anything. Like you and I are so different in that to where when you were kind of in your middle ground between ESPN and working at DraftKings, you were really antsy. Like you were going, I remember mom texting me when you guys were out at Notre Dame by campus and you would go to lunch at the linebacker all the time, which is yeah. one of the watering holes around there, usually where alumni go to get drunk. I think that place, as you so eloquently put it once, has vomit and corners for when you were in college in the 80s sure there. Yep, mine. That yeah. has just petrified and lasted for the last uh, three or four decades. But um, I remember mom texting me once that you guys went to the backer for lunch and you were essentially doing an impromptu radio show for the guys sitting at the bar there. You had takes that you needed to get off. You used to call me and mom all the time and just sort of give all these takes. I don't feel like I had that problem. Now I have an addiction to Twitter. So I was just getting them off online like I do normally. But uh, now coming back, the hardest part is guest booking. I, I truly have a newfound respect for so many people yeah. that have worked at ESPN around our shows that had the unenviable task of having to bother athletes, other writers, and people that cover sports and celebrities to come on these shows because, man, it is a tough hurdle for me to get over right now, repeat texting people like I am a thirsty ex trying to get back together. I agree. I, you know, and that's the one thing, you know, our, our mutual friends Stu Gott's always got on me for is not having any real connections. And I said, I never got them. Every, you know, there were bookers at ESPN. I never had to be the bad guy to try and figure, feel like I was bothering them, you know, to, to try and get them to come on a show. So I was never good. You know, like Wingo was always, Trey Wingo was great at getting numbers. He would, he would badger the hell out of somebody to get their number. And I never wanted to do that. I wonder, because you're right, I did hold an impromptu show one time with the linebackers. Those guys started it. They started asking me questions and I just kind of rolled into it. I wonder if this is the difference, though. I was asked to leave ESPN. I was still wanting to do it. So maybe it was prematurely, though, can you say a couple of decades is prematurely? I don't right. know. But, but I still wanted to do it, and I was basically, like a couple of teams I played for, I was asked to leave the premises. You chose to leave. ESPN for the, for this opportunity. So I wonder if there's a difference there because I wasn't really ready to stop the day-to-day -day activity. And so I was just looking for any outlet to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly a big part of it here. And obviously it's more of a habit for you. Like you just mentioned, you've been doing it for over two decades. So you're used to having that outlet for it. You're used to having a place to go with all that stuff. You know, I've done it for six and a half, seven years now, but it's still one of those things. I also just think naturally I'm better at sitting still and doing nothing than you are. I think that's one of my superpowers is man. If you give me some time and space, I can sit my ass off there and not do shit. The millennial is strong in me. Yeah. Right now though, uh, unless there's something good on Netflix or just right now I am binging drive to survive. Uh, I, I mean, I am Jess is so into F1. We talked last week cause she was at the Miami grand prix. She was there. And, and so I'm binging it right now. So that's the one time I will sit is to it, normally it's a like I just finished Ozark and I'll do some kind of drama or a comedy but but now it is sports it is drive to survive so you've watched it all correct uh no I'm still stuck in season three right now I've taken detours I've been trying to catch up on a lot of shows new schedule podcast I didn't ask for any of this etc yeah. etc so <laughs> yeah. it's uh it, it's I've been a little log jammed in season three still but I'm close to catching up there I also appreciate you say sitting and doing that stuff as if you don't watch every ounce of television that you do inside a bathtub well that's true your mother takes a bath and she saves it for me and I go in her bath I know it's been discussed I know you're disgusted by it uh but I will take the iPad in there and set it on the tub and uh and watch in there. I, and you know what? I, I'm not ashamed of it. Not one bit. You know what? At this point, you guys have a system that works. You guys clearly are both still like into each other after three decades. And so yeah. I'm a big, if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. Like we get to keep having one Christmas. It's awesome. And <laughs> we, 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 we all, we all know it. We all know at this point it too. If anything went south and you changed it up and for some reason that split apart you would be dead in weeks so I like having both my parents alive I know that you need mom to be alive and so we're gonna keep it that way man keep doing your weird bath thing it's, it's perfect yeah uh, mom soup 
the end of uh, the end of May will be our 35th year of wedding anniversary. So yes, and you're right. It's, it's a gr great way to me survive on the planet by being married to your mother because they would find me weeks later just dead laying on the couch if that yeah. weren't to be. So <laughs> all right, enough of the death and uh, and the baths. So <laughs> I I want I want to. I want to veer off this topic into a question for us in our years in sports. But, you know, I know it's going back a couple of days, but oh, my God, Saturday and Sunday, was it not incredible? Between Saturday and Sunday, you had five game sevens in the NHL, of which only one wasn't a one goal game. Only one was not a one goal game, which I thought was absolutely that was I think Edmonton beat the Kings two zip on a late goal. All the, the, the first two that game, Carolina over Boston and Tampa Bay over Toronto were two, one one goal games. And then Sunday, not only were they one goal games, but they were overtime. There is nothing like game seven overtime hockey. Uh, so before we jump to the NBA part of it, do you remember you guys were young when we first went to Arizona? When I was working there while at ESPN, do you guys remember going to the Coyote games in the whiteout and the playoffs and that? Uh, I do remember that mostly because my Coyotes memories are almost solely tied to, I have like such a vivid core memory of one of the pucks flying out of the ice. We were sitting yes. on the side of the rink outside of the nets and a puck got shot into the crowd and hit a lady in front of us directly in the face, like caught her right between the eyes. And I think it was a couple of games later, we saw that same lady back there with her nose patched up and still had the black eyes. And I just thought, wow, the ultimate hockey fan where you cannot pry this woman away from the ice time here. But yeah, I remember a lot of that stuff. I mean, I grew up, I had the poster on my wall in my bathroom for years of Keith Kachuk, Jeremy Roenick, and Nikolai Hobby Boo. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, like that that stuff all definitely, yeah, core memories from the Coyotes back in the you day. You know, add, adding to that story, not only did that lady get hit in the face, she was pregnant. Oh, God. And, and it was during a whiteout. So I remember taking my white <laughs> T-shirt off oh, no. to, to sta staunch the blood flying out of her face at that point turning a white shirt red with blood. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it was directly right in front of us. That thing caught her right in the grill. That was such a, such a wild team. But, but to me, as a spectator sport, I don't know if there's anything more exciting than playoff hockey when you are just, especially game seven, and to have five of them and two of them go to overtime was absolutely incredible. And on the other side of that, on oh, what was it? On, on Sunday, you had the, uh, the NBA, where you had two complete blowouts, right? One by 28 and the other by 33. I think Boston beat Milwaukee and the Mavs crushing the Suns, which being in Arizona right now, I mean, everybody was in, in shock, though. But you couldn't get two different sides of the coin with what b boring blowout games those were. Yeah, no, the NBA uh, Game 7s were the wimpy party horn of this, and... The NHL game sevens were very much like the boat horn blaring when people score a goal. Like, and part of it is, listen, I, I understand there's a difference between the two sports. Like in hockey, there is usually tends to be a scarcity of offense and goals. We don't see a lot of double digit goal games with everyone in there versus the NBA where there can be a little bit more ebbs and flows. Hockey, you get a hot goaltender the way that we saw, quite frankly, in a few instances. You mentioned right. that Calgary Dallas series, you know, Dallas almost single-handedly being compared. I think it was uh, Edinger, uh, Odinger, I, I forget how to pronounce his last name, but having one of the greater goalie games, I think the second most saves in a game seven in NHL postseason history. So you can get all those things, but yeah, playoff hockey's incredible. Like the, the best part, and I was with uh, this past weekend, a buddy of ours, Eric Ringle, who was a hockey uh, player on the Notre Dame hockey team. And Notre Dame still got plenty of guys that have been involved in this postseason. Brian Rust, who just finished up, with the Penguins and is one of the guys in that core that people are wondering, is he going to be around next year? Right. I think he's a free agent along with uh, Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin. And so, but I was talking to rings about it and he goes, yeah, he goes, it's the best tradition is after the series is over, finding out what litany of God awful injuries these guys are going to have surgery on because all we get throughout the majority of these series is upper or lower body injury. Right. And then somehow these guys just skate back out onto the ice. That was kind of the story with Sidney Crosby in this series, who I think was out for a couple of games, but was back for that game seven after that shot to the head and like game four or five. So it's that tradition, you know, everyone talks about the handshake lines at the end, but it's really that next day when it's like, 
oh yeah, this guy had a cracked fibula that he was playing the entire series with, and now he's going to have the procedure. So a, a few questions on that. First, first, real quick on that DraftKings Sportsbook. If you if you head over there in these series, Tampa Bay and Florida, Florida's minus 150. Carolina against uh, New York, they're minus 190. Colorado is minus 380 against St. Louis, and Calgary is minus 190 against Edmonton. Uh, and as far as the NBA is concerned, Boston is the favorite. They're minus 180 against the Heat. And Golden State is minus 230 against the Mavs. We'll, we'll get to the NBA in the blowout section of this. But uh, so let me start with this. And, and, and I have to take out combat sports because boxing and MMA, I mean, listen, you got to be tough to step in a ring, right? And where the object is to punch another man in the face in boxing or in the body and then MMA, it's to punch, elbow, or kick somebody all over the place. So I'm going to take those two out because that's the name of the game and go to sports where it doesn't rely on you always having to hit one another. I think the toughest athletes in the world outside of those combat sport are hockey players. I mean, when I see, when I see a power play, or I guess really any time, and dude's getting a pass and he's going to do the one-timer and just slap the living shit out of the puck – and guy in front of a defender just drops. I mean, he's fucking five feet in front of him, and he just drops and takes a full-speed slap shot somewhere on his body. Somewhere, whether it's the upper body or the lower body. And then when you see a hockey player get up slow, you know that shit had to hurt. I, I, I really don't know, again, outside of combat sports, if there are tougher athletes in the world. Yeah, and, and I think it's kind of that important distinction, right? Like, they're just sick bastards. Yeah. That's that's really the difference because I think football is ultimately a more violent sport. Yes, it is. Play. Yes, it is. Like yep. now hockey, you got the added, you know, force that comes with sliding on ice, skating on blades. But uh, yeah, no, they're they're just a sicko mentality wise. They're built like, I would say like goalies in lacrosse, like guys that are like kickoff coverage specialists in the NFL where you just got that extra screw loose where you don't care what happens with your body. And that was always the thing is like, I was acutely aware of how much shit hurt when I played. Like I was like, man, that didn't feel good. I don't want to do that again. I understand that's <laughs> part of the business here, but at some point with that next level up, like hockey is just a sport largely comprised of guys that don't seem to fear for their own safety ever. And it is amazing in a world of gambling that we have now that you can get away with upper body, lower body, right? Yeah. I mean, in, in this where all these, these gambling places want to know, you know, it's a, it's a pinky finger, you know, it's a ring finger, it's a thumb, it's the second toe, you know? I mean, you don't get that in, in hockey. And I'm, I'm somewhat amazed that that hasn't changed over time, and I wonder if it ever will. Yeah, between that, because you mentioned the impact of gambling on all of this and shameless plug on Gojo, we talked to Shayna Goldman, who's a staff writer at The Athletic that covers the NHL and one of the co-hosts of the Too Many Men podcast that is under the Levitard and Friends umbrella now, covering the NHL, covering hockey in its many forms. And she was telling us she's got kind of a data and analytics background in the way she covers hockey. And she mentioned it's difficult for the public to kind of get a read on as much as they could. Right of data things that can you know i think get the finer points of the game a tool that can help you better understand and better predict what's going to happen in some cases gambling wise in hockey because the nhl itself is so proprietary over a lot of that on ice information that happens in the games and i think we've seen with a lot of the other sports the nfl and some of these places where now when you're a league with official gambling partners a lot of that proprietary information becomes the things that help people set lines, the things that help people get more accurate information to go out there and affect the way sports gambling is consumed. Then I wonder if that's something the NHL, which seems a bit behind in that right. regard, yep. might eventually loosen the uh, loosen the belt on a little bit because it sounds like that info is kind of hard to come by you know, outside of just the injury report stuff to things that would make a better, more nuanced conversation around hockey and its understanding in the public. And I think it's one of those things they pride themselves on that. And they think it's one of the great things of hockey that you just play hurt. And you don't know what's hurt that, it, but, but to your point and really betters point, you wonder if it will come into this century at some point and say, okay, this was a, just because we did it this way doesn't mean it's the best way. Even though if we were players, I'm sure that's the way we'd like it. We never wanted to divulge what was hurt because I've talked about this many times. You know, if I see an old lineman with a wrapped elbow, I'm going to hit it. 
You know, and I'm everybody used to say, oh, is that sportsmanship? I don't give a shit about sportsmanship. I, if I know of an injury on somebody, I'm going to exploit that injury. You know, and I think that's one of the reasons in hockey they don't want to let anybody know is because you know that. And to me, there is nothing wrong with exploiting an injury if you're playing against that person. No, and you're right. Like teams in general, sports or, you know, otherwise are usually pretty apt to try and hold on to as much information. Coaches are paranoid because everyone, everyone in this sphere is looking for that like razor thin edge over their competition. And I'm sure they view anything like that getting out as something that affects that. So uh, I, I want to ask this question before I get to the, the blowouts of the NBA and the next round and a question about blowouts. So let's just take the four majors. <clears throat> and this is, we've done this, you know, in, in radio more than a few times. Singular effect. Who has the most? Hockey goalie, baseball pitcher, football quarterback, or basketball, you know, great two-way player? Who has the most effect? do you think on a game? I mean, it probably would have to be basketball player, right? Like a player like, you know, use the umpteenth example and say LeBron James, who can affect the game so much on both ends of the court. I, that's probably got to be it. Cause everyone else, like you saw them in half, they've got one half of the game that they can really affect. And so I'd probably have to give it to the NBA guys. All right. I would agree. So now let's do this. Let's take the NBA out and only put the three in where you can only handle one side the goalie just defense basically the pitcher just defense and the quarterback just offense of who could have the most effect on a game um I would probably say then um I'd probably go pitcher uh then just because I think you've got the most opportunities potentially and the most time you could be out there like depending on game flow football you've got special teams so right, your quarterback right. might have to sit on the sideline longer than most people on the ice one team could dominate possession the same way you see in soccer where one goalie just ends up chilling over there on the other end of the ice and while those guys certainly hockey you know a goalie and a pitcher kind of occupy the same space especially in the postseason where if one starts to go nuts in supernova now all of a sudden your team's got a chance but I would say pitching just because you have to be out there for not, you know, you have to be out there for three outs an inning minimum for nine innings. That's just how it goes. So I, that's, that's my debate. I take the quarterback out of it just for the reasons there's special teams that there's, there's defense. I, I take the quarterback out. I get what you're saying about the pitcher, but the pitcher has, has defense behind him. They can make incredible plays that can help the pitcher pitch a, a, a shutout or a no hitter or whatever. The goalie, now the goalie certainly has defense with him, but we've talked all the time about goalies standing on their head, and that's the reason that a team will move through sometimes because the goalie is standing on his head. So I wonder, while again, you have to have some help, even though the goalie has help, but the goalie is stopping the shots, facing, what, anywhere from 25 to 35 shots a game, where while the pitcher, I, I'm with you, is throwing in the 90s or 100 pitches a game if he throws a complete game, has, I think, a little more help behind him to help him for his cause. Yeah, I would say I, I would disagree on that one and say that I, I think goalies have a fair amount of help in front of them as well. They're protected almost like the quarterback class. And yeah, you can have outlier performances on both where you have a goalie like Dallas did who really goes above right. and beyond much the same way you can have a pitcher who goes out and has, you know, 15 strikeouts in a game or something like that. But I just think, again, the biggest difference for a pitcher, and now you could argue in this day and age where we've got so many openers, people cycle through so many pitchers. We went through the thing, I think, with Kershaw earlier in the year. Right, right. Where he's in the no-hitter in the seventh, and they take him out because they're worried about the postseason and the pitch count. But if we were to just isolate it down to – because hockey, we've seen multiple goalies for a lot of these teams in the postseason for one reason or another. It's not like there's not some relief there. But I just think the pitcher, because – you have got to be out there. You know, I understand counts can get long on the other side. It's different, but depending on how you do your job, there's still a set time. You've got to be out there holding down and understanding your business. One thing we both agree, it's either the goalie or the pitcher. We take the quarterback out of that. But, and I agree with you, you get a great two-way player, 
you know, uh, on, on the basketball court. That's going to that's gonna decide a lot, which would bring me in to a question about the NBA. So Sunday we had two Game 7s in the NBA, which were, which were complete blowouts. Boston takes Milwaukee out 109-81 and 123-90. Mavs take out the Suns. Two complete blowouts. Um, I mean, it, it, the, the shocking one, as I was sitting there watching it, because I live in Arizona, is the Suns, the best record in all of basketball. And they get to this game. You know, between Booker and Aiton and Chris Paul, you get a bunch of no-shows, which is somewhat stunning for a team that was supposed to be the best or at least had the best record in the NBA. I know a lot of people feel Golden State could be the best team coming out of the West. Now they'll get that shot against Dallas. But which one was more surprising to you from the blowout standpoint? Um, I mean, I thought just the way the Suns got completely punked in that game, right? Like it was Luka Doncic just laughing in their face the entire time in, in that game seven. So I'd probably go with them. Boston and Milwaukee, you know, especially with Chris Middleton out, we had kind of seen <laughs> right, right. that Milwaukee outfit was leaking oil a little bit. You even go back a few games and uh, Boston, when they kind of stole a game, they entered the fourth quarter down. I think it was the second loss in Celtics postseason history when they were up nine or more entering the fourth quarter. And the only other one had been in the bubble. So they got sort of hot late, but we saw the Bucks role players just kind of weren't up to it. They don't have someone who can really go and get their own shot without Chris Middleton. So that one to me made more sense than a Suns team that was at full strength and just wilted when Dallas decided, Hey, we're just going to stress the hell out of Chris Paul on both ends of the floor, make the 37-year-old tired, and then watch the rest of that team collapse around it. They just absolutely folded, and, and Luca was incredible. Spencer Dinwiddie, my God, was, was in, uh, amazing. Ooh. So at the, as the taping of this now, uh, we're getting ready for the first game, Boston against Miami. Again, um, Boston the favorite in this one. And Marcus Smart questionable with a midfoot sprain. We know how that is, man. I mean, if, if there's any chance for him to go. Though it is different in football playoffs where one game you lose, you're done. In a best of seven, some, and a game one, you may you may go on, on the side of, you know, let's let's rest him and be smart. But I have a feeling Marcus Smart's going to – I would no, no doubt he wants to be out on the court. It's just a matter of will he be out on the court. Yeah, and, and if he is, this series, I mean, everyone's called it a rock fight and everything else. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating to kind of realize how similar these teams are. This is like old school. Spolster's called it like old school, like 90s basketball, you know, and it's possible with the defense. Well, they I mean, shit, we'll see if the refs allow that. Because exactly. The official, I mean, I, I feel like we have stopped once every four, se four like, possessions for a review for a flagrant one. Yeah. I, I don't know what the NBA has got to do about that going forward, whether it's speeding some of those up, you know, uh, deciding them without having to stop. And because I understand they've done the thing where the official goes over and explains what's happening to the microphone. It helps the TV audience kind of know what's going on, but it just turns this into a churn. And remember we went through this with the NFL not too long ago with right. a lot of the reviews. Yep. And so they made that change to where the review happens sight unseen. It happens quickly and it just gets told to the official and we keep things moving. They expedited the process on that and it helped the product a ton. And I think if you're Adam Silver in the NBA assessing your postseason product, which we know all their eggs are in that basket at this point, that's modern NBA basketball. I think you've got to take a look at how you make that better because it's been a massive eyesore on the postseason. So, yeah, so I don't want to be that, you know, the guy on the get off my lawn and say, boy, how the game was played. I don't want to ever do that because games change over eras and decades. It's just the way it is. And we're in this era of basketball, which which is not as physical as when I was growing up in the basketball we watch. And, I, and I'm not going to sit here and say better or worse, just different. But the one thing that can sway it and or make you roll your eyes and or and nowadays make everybody go on Twitter is exactly that. It's the delays. It's the constant whistles because, and you said it perfectly, and it's where I was going to go when Spolster talked about this is like 90s basketball. Well, that's, that's completely up to the refs, completely up to how the refs are going to want to call this one. Are we going to get quick whistles? You know, someone three minutes into the game going to have two fouls, you know, and we're going to say, oh, shit, okay, this is the way we're going to go or have those long, like you said, delays on a flagrant one where I know people back in the day would laugh at that. But, again, it's where we are now. But I, I am in agreement that they need to do something about that going forward. We've seen other sports do that as well. So, 
four teams left in the NBA. Right now, if you could pick one guy that's your guy, who would it be? Luca. It would be Luca. See, I and I think everybody immediately would go to that, but Luca's a liability on defense. Jason Tatum is a two way player. Yeah, I know Luca's averaging 31 and 10. Uh, you know, but it's not like, you know, Jason's he's averaging 28, you know, so just a few points less. And he's also big time on defense. So I, I feel sometimes defense gets short changed. I know how Luca can take over a game and God knows how they're going to go, you know, who's going to guard him at times for Golden State. But it just seems like sometimes, you know, uh, Tatum is a great offensive player and, oh, by the way, can play defense as well. Sometimes I just I think that gets lost on people. Yeah, I just kind of like the guy who's an asshole. Like yeah. <laughs> Spencer Hall tweeted this the other day, a great college football writer. Yeah. He said, Steph Curry's trying to score. Giannis is trying to dominate. Luka Doncic is trying to make the man guarding him cry and give up the game of basketball forever. Like when they asked him about after the game, did you know you had as many points as the Suns at halftime? And he just laughed and said, yes. Him staring at um, Devin Booker at the, fa- yeah. at the free throw line, like, all of it's just perfect. And I feel like that kind of edge paired with a coach and Jason Kidd who, you know, we talked to Ryan Hollins who played with him earlier in the week. Like Jason Kidd, obviously famed big basketball brain at the point guard spot. Ryan talked about what an underrated defensive mind he is and how that's been so pervasive in Dallas. But Jason Kidd's also kind of like a, a head case in some bad ways. Like if you look back at his time in Milwaukee with Giannis and the Bucks. They talk about all the mind games that he plays with guys on his team. And the fact that that's meshed well with Luca, who seems to naturally have some of that edge to him really does want to go out and rub your nose in it. I'm just always drawn to that guy. I'll take him. He's also a great showing for thick basketball players in this postseason because everyone's talked about body composition and said, he's going to have to lose weight for the 82 game season. And he's just like, no, I think I'm good. And he keeps going out there and uses it to his advantage. I mean, when you're going down there with a point guard of that size or a point four or whatever you want to call him and just able to absolutely body dudes that wears, those are body blows over a long series that we saw add up against Chris Paul. Two guys I never want to change is Luca and Nikolai Jokic, you know, dad bod. I I don't want it to change. Just, just, just stay, you know, be who you are. Don't all of a sudden, you know, start doing the avocado ice cream and, and you know change your physique around. You know, just just be who you are. So, uh, so who do you like? Since both these series, again, at the taping of this, hasn't started yet. Who do you see in the finals? Yeah, I'm gonna go with Boston out of the East. I think that's a seven game series, and I, I think that's got you know, you know, very very close potential because of the defense in both of those. I'm going to go with Dallas coming out of the West. I I think it's been weird, man, watching Golden State in the last few rounds. It just hasn't seemed quite as automatic, you know, and Dallas is going to push them defensively. Memphis was really the umpteenth example. They're so young and hungry. That's very much got remnants of the grindhouse teams there. And even once they lost Ja, they still went out and were able to give them so much of that effort, Dylan Brooks and the rest of that team. And it just made Golden State uncomfortable in a way that was a bit surprising. Like we've been used to Steph and Clay just being able to be that deluge from beyond the arc and ruin people's lives. And they never seemed to be able to really get traction on the tires with that through that series. And so I don't know if that's a one-off in that series, if it's just not quite the full Golden State flamethrower that it once was. It's still a very good one, but I think knowing what they were and seeing what that last series looked like, I have questions enough to say maybe I'll ride the hot hand in Dallas. Yeah, I'm going to go Boston, uh, and I'm going to go Golden State. And I, I and I love Draymond Green in these situations, man. When these are monster games, he is just a piece of work, and I love how quickly he goes and does his podcast after games. I think is is pretty cool as well. Again, uh, DraftKings Sportsbook right now. Boston is at minus 180. The Heat at plus 150. Golden State at minus 230. And the Mavs are plus 190. So uh, so one more on on this. Because they were blowouts. We're, and, I, and I have a feeling I know where you're going to go on this one. And sorry, I hate to do it to you. Worst blowout you have ever been involved with on the bad side. And just kind of your mentality and how you when you know it's over 
Like in these games, you know it's over. Why are you asking me like you don't already I, know the answer? I just said I probably know the answer. But you don't probably know the okay. answer. You know the answer. Okay, so say well, it. I want you to make your pretty little mouth say it. 2012 regular season at Notre Dame. You guys were 12-0, and 0, went to the national championship against Alabama, and you got stomped. It was one of those games where four or five minutes in or first quarter in, you knew it was over. So – What's that mentality? And I'll give you mine after this, but what's that mentality? What were the Suns feeling? What was Milwaukee feeling? Especially the Suns. At one point, they were down 40-something in that game when you know there's not a damn thing you can do to get back in a monster spotlight game. Well, when you're a guy like me who is a role player on that team and going to be hopefully trying to be like an undrafted free agent the way I was in the NFL – there were one main thought was self-preservation. We are not going to win this game, but I have to go out here and try to win enough reps to not look like a scrub because people are going to watch this film because it's against Alafreak and Bama. And then two was don't let them catch you slipping on the sideline. I had time in the second and third quarter to start processing my college football career being over, which that's right. This was your, this was your last game, right? That was was my very last game. And so I had time to process some of those emotions, which does make you emotional as you're sitting there and kind of seeing your teammates, you know, uh, one of my teammates and fifth year seniors, one of our captains, Capron Lewis Moore tore his ACL in the middle of that game. And so you see stuff like that and you feel yourself getting emotional. And then you remember there are cameras everywhere. And you do not want to be the guy that they are running on TV all the time that they caught slipping in this game. We saw that with the young lady from South Carolina who was a part of the championship run who they caught the year ago. Uh, was it Aaliyah Boston? Am I? Uh... I believe so, yeah. The player of the year this the past year, yeah. Yeah, but – um, but you know, and you saw how personally she took that notion right. of being the one whose highlight they ran and he didn't want to be that person. So I was like, all right, whatever. They're not going to catch me slipping. And then by the fourth quarter, you're starting to think about, all right, well, they're still having the after party. I'm still going to get drunk tonight. It's just going to be a different kind of drunk. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just got, especially in a physical sport like that, where, you know, and unlike basketball, where at some point they just unload the bench. So if you're one of the starters, you were the starting right guard in that game. They weren't unloading the bench. You know, in basketball, they kind of well, do that. Not, not, they got to the fourth quarter and they started going. I saw some clean jerseys popping out there in the fourth quarter. No, I mean, you. You weren't coming. You oh, were coming oh, out of the no. Game. Yeah, no, there wasn't no curtain call for us. They were, yeah. I mean, hell, we learned that early on in the season. We didn't have a ton of O-line depth. And so you were going to ride that one out until the bitter end. Yeah, it, it, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. I had one, my last year playing really was with the Dolphins in 93. We went to this to play the Chargers. This is when they were in San Diego, gang. You young, youngsters out there, Chargers used to be in <laughs> you San young, Diego. You youngsters, it was You're, like three years ago. Yeah, you know what? Still, some of them will never remember that. They won't. <laughs> right? Just like that much time has passed. Just, just like they don't remember there was ever a Houston Oilers who I played for. Okay? All right, well, that one, that one's legitimate. Like, unless we're showing Warren Moon highlights and you know pulling what? out the baby blues. But the Chargers I, moved like three years ago. <laughs> and, and you know what? I'm not giving the youngsters that much credit to, uh, to even the, know. So The youngsters. The youngsters. But we played the Chargers. We got smoked in that game, I think 45 to 20. But the worst part for me, I was not a great pass rusher in the league. And I've joked about this many times. Nine years in the league, I had 11 and a half sacks. So that's averaging a little over one a year, which is not great. Consistent, but consistently bad. I was I was definitely a run stopper. That was kind of my forte. I always had my best games, especially when I played in Philly, against Washington because they like to run that counter tray and I was better against the run. Well, in that game, the Chargers rushed for over 220 yards. So that was kind of my knowing going back on the field as they were running. It's a horrible feeling. I've always said there's getting beat on a football field and there's getting your ass whooped physically. And I don't know how you felt in that game against Bama, but you know, there's one thing to get thrown all over, right? But this team, they basically lined up and they could basically say, we're going to run right here or we're going to run right there. And they did it. And they did it, which, which is kind of like the, the Patriots and the Bills when they played in that real windy, shitty weather and the Patriots ran the ball like a thousand times. They just line up and say, we're going to run the ball. 
And me as a run stopper just got buried in that game, play after play, as they just chunked yards on us. That was one of the worst feelings because, yeah, not only did we get beat, but I, I physically got beat up bad in that game. And it's a hor- horrible because I tried to say this, and I know you know this as well. Every time you, you're playing in a game and you're in a shitty play, you start thinking about what it's going to look like in film the next day. Yep. It is uh, hard to run away from. That's the old eye in the sky don't lie thing. But yeah, there's nothing worse than physically getting your ass whooped. Ironically, my most memorable ass whooping physically like that, that I can at least recall off the top of my head, came at the hands of my co-host and producer, Brandon Newman, on the podcast. Really? We played play in the U.S. Army All-American game, and I was like 265, 270. Right. Brandon was 320, and a lot of those guys, I mean, I was – physically not as far along as a bunch of those dudes and one-on-ones I was getting my ass wore out out there and it was one of those where I picked myself up and go shit college football might be hard college yeah. football <laughs> might be a little harder than I'm giving it credit for if this is what high school plus football feels like yeah yeah that was like okay I got I got a few months I need to work on or a few shit. years where I got to work on this shit yeah, yeah 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 I remember being in the stands watching those practices too just trying to say, okay, I have to think of something positive to say now. <laughs> yeah, man. What a shocker. Connecticut high school football hadn't prepared yeah. me for the rigors of big time D1 football. In yeah, the yeah. That was a bit different to some of the others in the country. That was, that was a game that you obviously, you ran into uh, Andrew Luck in the, uh, I always love that story. When, oh, man. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, Andrew Luck coming up to me in the tunnel before the game and I hear this big nerdy Muppet voice behind me. It's like, oh, uh, hey, I'm like, I think our dads played together in Houston. I'm like, all right, whatever, nerd. Like, yeah, I'm hanging out, <laughs> I'm hanging out with my Notre Dame friends, my other yeah. buddies that are five stars and all that stuff. Years later, when they curb stomped us in Palo Alto, it was one of the worst games I ever played in my life. I walked up to him after the fact, said, what's up? Hey, Andrew, I think our dads played together. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like again, man. Pulled the shame shit when I saw him at Lucas Oil for the national championship this year, which is wild, by the way, seeing him and Robert Griffin the third next to each other. Oh yeah, down in the ESPN control room before you know Andrew Luck was getting ready to go and be a part of some part of the pregame show right. for ESPN, but just staring at those two guys that have been the top two quarterbacks in their draft class and seeing them clearly not playing football anymore was a, a sight to behold in a lot of ways. Yeah, pretty wild. One by choice, the other by not choice <laughs> yeah. as far as uh, uh, not in the league. All right, uh, so we made our picks for that. A couple of other things I, I want to finish up with. First, the PGA you know, championship is, is this weekend in Tulsa, the next uh, uh, big tournament. And, man, it's been all of a sudden it's like it's here, and it's like, oh, yeah, Tiger's playing again. I mean, it's so bizarre now, A, that he's even playing again his first tournament back other than playing with his, with his son, Charlie, in that one father-kid uh, tournament. He played in the Masters and started out. I, I kind of felt good about my analysis. I said, I bet he comes out of the gate pretty good, but he hasn't you know, walked four rounds competitively in a while, and you wonder if it'll catch up to him. And he made the cut and then kind of, kind of faded. And I think he's, uh, for the DraftKings Sportsbook, he's plus 6,500 to win this one, which isn't shocking. But I, I think I would kind of expect the same thing that I think he'll start out well. Again, this is in Tulsa. And then, you know, while it's five weeks, he's been able to get stronger. Everyone, I think, keeps hoping that that he's in it on Sunday. I think that that's the wish list, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we're always going to sit around. And that's, you know, a, a, always a weird spot for the PGA because you're going to take this tiger bump for as long as it goes. But you know, eventually it's not going to be the case. Now they said he feels better walking on the leg this week than he had, than he did at the masters, but yeah, we're all addicted to tiger woods. We can't quit that drug. No, not at all. And I think the, uh, one of the biggest notes coming out of the PGA is the fact that it's going to cost you when you get thirsty there, it's going to cost you a bottle of water is $6, a Michelob ultra Mike, $18. $18 $18 for a Mick Ultra. And by the way, a Mick Seltzer is $19. When did it, it has, now, I'm not a seltzer drinker. Has seltzer been more expensive than beer? I, I, I honestly don't know that. I don't do the seltzer thing, but the Mick Seltzer is a buck more than Michelob Ultra, the beer. Yeah, they could probably upcharge you a little bit that, especially compared to because it's Michelob Ultra, which no offense, like that's golf water. Like it's just, you know. <laughs> 
that, that, that to me is what it is. There's no way in God's green earth to quote you that I'm paying $18 for a Mick ultra. Like at some point I, like, we have to stand on principle for certain things. I believe that in the airport, there is nothing there that is good enough for me to wait in a line. Boom. And there is no other place. You know, I can find some replacement level product at a place with a comparatively lesser line. I don't understand that. And in this instance, like, I'll just get drunk in the parking lot before. If I really want to be pissed drunk that bad, I'll go and rip nips in the parking lot or buy a do something. Like I, I went to college. I know how to do this. I don't need to pay $18 for a Mick Ultra. Like maybe it'll be a couple in there. And at some point you need to kind of, you know, up your buzz a little bit over a long day. But dear God, there has got to be a better way. I mean, wine is 13 bucks and cocktails are $19. I mean, I'm with wine, you. Wine's only 13 bucks? Yeah. Oh man, we're getting the boys are getting wine drunk at the PGA championship. Yeah, who man. knows what kind of wine? Who knows what kind of wine hey, it is? Though? Listen, I don't care. I have had enough wedding wine. You're gonna see me walking around there with purple lips and wine <laughs> teeth, just <laughs> shouting mashed potatoes at Xander Shoffley <laughs> as don't he ever, gets ready to tee off. God, don't ever be that guy. Please don't ever be that guy. John Rahm, uh, Scotty Scheffler, and Justin Thomas are basically the the top three favorites uh, in that one. So that's going on. We'll see how, what target. How about, how about Phil, too, still ducking his head out of this one, man? <clears throat> I mean, this whole thing, Mike, with uh, the Saudi Arabia uh, uh, League that's starting that, uh, you know, I was just talking with your mom about this. Phil, now we know why Phil got in hot water with what he said. Hey, we know all the shitty things the, they have done there, but hey, you know, why am I doing this? It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance for the PG. I mean, it, it couldn't have sounded worse, right? But... Your mother asked this question, and and and, I, and I'll ask it to you. Phil is basically now he has not been heard from outside of his apology, and we have no idea when he's going to come back. He's basically, as they call you know, the, the cancel culture. Why is Greg Norman not being obliterated? Greg Norman is basically the director of this new league coming out to battle the PGA, and he has said some ridiculous things. You know, with with the with the uh, journalist that was dismembered, you know, there and basically said, "Oh, they're going to learn from their mistakes." I mean, what the fuck are you talking about? How has Greg Norman not gotten smoked for some of his comments as opposed to Phil? Well, I think Greg Norman had a day where you know the media cycle kind of yeah. latched on to those comments right. that he made, but fewer people care about Greg Norman. Phil Mickelson I, I think, outside yeah. of Tiger Woods is one of the bigger names left in the sport. I, I think especially in this week, like the fact that he's not going to come back and try and defend the Claret Jug at the way, you know, winning it last year, becoming the oldest winner there. I, I think for a lot of those reasons and Phil, especially in the oh, last Oh, wait, wait, you, you mean, you mean the Wanamaker? The Wanamaker, sorry. Wanamaker. Uh, the Wanamaker, yeah. But, um, but the fact that, Phil is just overall, I think, a more visible, more important, and in some instances was, you know, more liked depending on who you were, but I just think he was a more important figure, and he had kind of positioned himself, you know, I think a lot of people, especially the casual fan, you know, knew Phil Mickelson much more readily. Greg Norman, it took me a while to even remember, oh, he's the head guy on this, because for so long, Phil had kind of positioned himself as the guy that was yeah. in the center of all this trying to leverage one side against the other. And, and you're right, Phil coming off a win last year. Phil had kind of kind of been reborn, right? Because he hit social media hard. He, he joined Twitter and Instagram late. But remember, he was great on it. And then they played some of these matches, and he was, when they were all mic'd up, you know, he did a really good job. I'm, I'm with you. I think he became kind of popular again as an older golfer now, older, you know. Um, so I, I think I agree with that, but, it, but it is, was amazing to me that Norman is actually basically running this thing, uh, uh, which is starting, I think in June in London. And, uh, and, and he has, I, he did have that day though. I do remember, uh, him having that day, but who knows when Phil will be back. Cause he knows he's going to have to answer questions about it. This is the second major he's now missing. So. Uh, we'll see when he actually comes back from this. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, Mark Slaybaugh and Kevin Van Valkenburg did a great article on Phil's absence on ESPN.com the other day. And one of the things they mentioned, because those quotes that came out from Phil talking about, we know what bad guys these are, their records with human rights, was from a biography about right. Phil that's right. getting set to come out. And part of that was also, you know, the $40 million he reportedly lost over a number of years in gambling. And that issue with, um, I think his name was Billy Walters. 
um, who was a part of that insider trading thing right. that Phil was a part of, who ended up, I think, doing time. He did is time. Now- yeah, he did time. Uh, Phil had to pay back like a million dollars in ill-gotten gains, I think they said. And and this guy who got out is getting ready to write a book, right? And I think they said that's what Phil is probably yeah. as worried about as anything right now. Right. Because the quote in the article that got a lot of the headlines was a source told ESPN, Billy Walters is not a man to be trifled with. And so I, I think Phil is probably trying to put together and try and get as much information as he can before he comes back out on this because – you know, I don't know. They they pointed out a lot of good stuff about how you probably wouldn't have gotten pushed too much right. by the golf media on all of this. Right. But it's just, it's wild to see the downfall here. And, you know, if this guy ever comes back fully to yeah. form, less like from fans and his peers, because we've seen plenty of people there, but like our sponsors, which that was Phil. I mean, the, you know, Mizzen and Main weird commercial of him karate kicking golf oh, balls. yeah. And, you know, uh, all his partners, I wonder if that stuff ever fully comes back in a day and age where people are more conscious of where they're putting their money to and how that relates to these larger societal human rights issues and the way that that reflects on them. Yeah, he had had, you know, the the same sponsors for decades and they just dumped them. I think even Callaway said they, they had a deal with him for the rest of his playing career and they're on pause from that as well. And to your point, Billy Walters, said, all he said, all Phil had to do was just tell the truth, but he was more worried about his image uh, than that. And this guy is now writing a book, so it's going to be it's going to be very interesting where that one goes. <clears throat> All right, so let's finish. it. It's tough for us to, to not finish on talking a little bit of football, but there's not a ton going on in the NFL. The big news is that Sean Watson, who, again, has not been indicted on any charges against him, but does have the 22 civil lawsuits Uh, going against him now with the Cleveland Browns. He's getting set to be in the Bahamas to work out with some of his teammates. But this week, I don't know when this week, again, we tape this early in the week, he is supposed to meet with the NFL. Do you think there is any way, Mike, any way at all, he skirts suspension? And if not, how many games do you think he's going to get? I I think they sit him down for the entire year. Really? Yeah. I I don't know. I I don't know how you can't honestly, based on past precedents where we've seen players who have been dealing with one instance of sexual impropriety and legal issues that did not go to court in the same way. We understand this did not go to, um, um, God, I'm already forgetting my legal mumbo jumbo from all this, but it was not a criminal case. So it didn't go to a jury trial in that way. This is now in civil court. But we've seen instances of the past where Zeke Elliott's of the world yep. were suspended for six game and others. And so if you're going to give someone six games for that, if I'm the NFL, I'd come out and try and suspend him for two years, understanding that the PA might get you down to one. I think you've got to try and hammer this guy because conduct detrimental is a broad umbrella that they get to work under. I know Roger Goodell is not the arbitrator in this hearing anymore. That was a change in the recent CBA. So that responsibility is delegated to somebody else, but this has been a process where Deshaun Watson has, you know, we already know missed a season, but that was paid. He was not suspended in that way. He was still collecting money and then was just rewarded with the richest guarantee in NFL history by the Browns. At some point, if you're the NFL, as much as no one's going to believe it, you've got to try to send the message that what has gone on here around this and the attention that it has brought your league is not okay. And, And based on what we've seen in the past, I think that there is room for them to really come down with something severe when you've still got 22 pending civil suits in this case hanging over the entirety. And they have to, right? I mean, there are going to be those that are saying, wait a minute, you know, let's see what happens. Why don't you wait and see what happens with the civil suits? He didn't get indicted. So nothing from that that legal standpoint is going to get him in, in, in a court uh, outside of the civil suits. But they've already set the precedent. Just what you said, with Ben Roethlisberger, with Zeke Elliott and others, they set the precedent that they're going to sit you down. So I agree with you. I don't think they can not sit him down. It's going to be for how long? I never thought you'd say a year. Their speculation would be six games, eight games. I remember when Kareem Hunt, when and there was actual video of him, you know, before Kansas City cut him, when he kicked a woman on the ground, the Browns, the same team, by the way, still signed him knowing there was going to be a suspension and he got suspended eight games. And they waited the eight games. And listen, Kareem Hunt, from a football standpoint, has been really good for the Browns. So 
I got to, while, while I don't know if it's going to be a year, I got to believe it's going to be at least eight games. I, I, I think if you, what we just mentioned, six games, eight games for one instance, I feel like it's got to be more than that. And by so the they way, can get, so they can come down to what you're saying, basically hit them heavy and let the, let the union, if yeah, they choose to come in and try and appeal. Because we understand that's the job of the union as right. unsavory as it is for all of us looking at it as outsiders, they have got to go and argue on behalf of the player in instances like this, maybe because of the gravity and just the sheer volume of this, the PA might dial back some on that, but that part of that is just how that has to work. But yeah, and I mean, listen, the Browns prepared for that. We saw the way that they structured all this. The Browns literally structured his deal so that if he was suspended for some or all of this season, he'd be losing the least amount of money possible. Like his base salary this year is basically nothing as yeah. a far of a bite out of his total guarantees. So they planned for this financially, which again, also feels gross. Everything yeah, feels gross around this. It's going to stain everything that the Browns do from here on out and make it conflicted as how we're supposed to digest this. But I, I ultimately think the NFL is going to try and send a message with this one, even if at this point, any message the NFL sends on this front should and could fall on deaf ears. But, 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 but I'll say this, you know, and I don't want to keep belaboring it, but, but then, then we just move on. Shouldn't we have been outraged at Kareem Hunt? We actually had video I, of him kicking we, a woman. We, and the, we were, we were. Oh, oh, but we but were. then it goes away, right? Well, yeah, listen, I, and listen, this is the difficult part of sports is we're so addicted to the product right. that a lot of people will go out. And I will say this, and uh, Mina Kimes made this point when she first addressed this on her podcast a long time ago when the signing first happened. It is also inherently different with a quarterback. Because for the rest of these guys, we talk about it being a helmet sport. That is the literal face of your franchise in most instances. We talk about what a different class they operate in, and that's always been the case. And so bringing Kareem Hunt over while feeling shitty to be a guy that's part of the backfield rotation with Nick Chubb is a lot different than the guy that you just put in the quarterback position that's now expected in Cleveland to maybe be the savior of this franchise and the reason they're competitive in the AFC North. Like there's an inherent difference in what this position brings and is involved in, in your franchise that makes this an even more difficult conversation. And I think we'll make it a lot harder. I mean, I've heard more people who are Browns fans say, I'm not sure how to root for this team in the fall. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to go back with them because for them, this was a bridge too far with these kind of allegations in this position. Yeah. And the amount of money they gave them and how, just as you mentioned, how they structured it by saying just a million dollars, your only is your salary this year. So if you get suspended, you won't lose that much money. It does. It all feels dirty, but at the end of the day, you know, I, there, while there are going to be fans that say, I don't know if I can root for the Browns will be other fans that say, I just care about what's going on in the field. I'm, I'm not asked to worry about what's off the field. I just want to see us win. So it's up to everybody individually and deal with it on how they want to deal with it. Now, how I want to deal with you as we wrap this up is I have to make an apology to you. Um, when we were in New York a couple of weeks ago, uh, doing some stuff for, for Notre Dame. Oh yeah. We, uh, you know, we, we had a couple of nice days there with, with the Notre Dame people, Marcus Freeman there, Jack Swarbrick and a whole bunch of, uh, Notre Dameers that, that we were involved in. It was a lot of fun. And and, and I, as I was heading back to Arizona, you were going back to Connecticut. And you said, Dad, I'm giving you this card, this Mother's Day card. This was right before Mother's Day. Instead of me mailing it, I'm just going to give it to you so you can give it to Mom, uh, since I was going home there. This was a couple of weeks ago. Right before I left for this trip where I am in Dallas right now, I got my backpack out. And by the way, it's now well past Mother's Day. As I looked through my backpack, I found said card. So your mother had gone all this time thinking you had not sent her a card. And so I gave it to her just a couple of days ago. And I have to publicly apologize to you for that. Yeah, that's some bullshit. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, got yeah, that, like... I got that thank you text from mom the other day. Because I, I like people might not be aware. I pride myself on being the card guy. Like I have a heavy arsenal of uh, greeting cards that I stack up when I go out places. I love card stores. 
I love trying to find the perfect card for the perfect person and all that. And it's freaking Mother's Day. I was banking on this as the thing. And I thought, well, you know what? Instead of leaving it in the hands of the Postal Service and all the supply chain issues and all the things that make that difficult, I can just make this a one-to-one transaction. And you managed to mess that up. So yeah, apology very much warranted and begrudgingly accepted because it actually finally got there. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the last question I'll ask you before uh, we end this is, will that action affect the Father's Day gift that you had planned to get me? Oh, yeah. I mean, now there's just going to be shit smeared inside your card and it's going to arrive a month late. So you're not going to suspect it. It's going to be like when people mail glitter bombs to people and all of a sudden you open up the envelope and now you've got a mess to clean up. You just walked into the lion's den now. I love you too. Thanks. (laughs) Heheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheh